this is a question I want to pose to kind of get us started tonight. So uh, the first chapter, Bodega finally gets to see Vera. And, you know, I wrote on here at the end of the chapter, I read this part a couple nights ago, and I'm just now reading my notes to it. And y'all, I wrote like in the book, this is the most insecure man I've ever met in my entire life. I like wrote that on page 117. I said he's internet insecure. I'm not quite sure what I even meant by that. But the idea that Bodega like had like needed needed better to know that he had made some money and bought a fancy car and, and could wear a silk suit. Kind of, I guess, flaunting that. What do y'all think about the idea of waiting so long for a love and then the only thing you can show for your life after 20 years are material things and not anything, any richness of, of yourself, any richness um, maybe of like a word or, or some actual advice or guidance or, or any type of skill even to, to share with someone. I, I, I thought about this a lot and I, first I judged, first I judged Bodega, but then I, I realized, I think I was, I'm, I'm kind of wrapped up in that idea of flaunting some sort of material or, or even career success before I, I, who, who I am as a, as a woman and what I've learned and, and how I've healed and what I've healed from. I feel like I, 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 wanna, I want myself to be somebody that flaunts that first. But I think after reading this, round three, after reading just round three, I kind of, I judged that boy immediately. But then once I kind of thought about it just today, literally right now while we're kind of sitting here, I just realized that like, I think I am, I have some of that too, that insecurity, that just wanting to be able to hang with the best of them, whatever that even means and show off to somebody that got away. Uh, what do y'all think about that? What do y'all think about that idea of being rich material wise and poor, maybe in the soul? No, you're not poor in the soul. Come on now, Brandon. He's not poor in the soul. I don't think he's poor in the soul either. I think he, remember, she said he didn't want to be with him because he had no vision. He needs to prove to her he not only am able to get the money, but now he looks, remember, she married mm -hmm. for money. Now he has to show her maybe he has both, the vision to make it big in Harlem, mm -hmm. and now he looks like money so you're not gonna breed out um all what you said on the first instinct you see all of us here and you breathe that from like you don't see that from all of us on the first like your soul and everything else um when you see somebody she's probably like okay it's a man who can hang a suit look damn good so that alone <laughs> he's gotta make sure he looks good i, I don't think he was um you know I don't think I don't think that, Brandon. Especially a silk suit. <laughs> what I mean by that is like he couldn't even approach her by himself. He had to beg like somebody. Oh yeah, him yeah. Work or want to work Chino. He, he, wasn't he had butterflies. He was in. He loves her. In Twenty he was, years. Yeah, he was nervous. <laughs> I might take somebody with me. If I, listen, I I saw my husband after a couple of years, like ten years later, at a barbecue, and I was like, oh my god, there he is. <gasps> I was like, somebody has to come with me. Like, this is him. I, I, I get it. You're nervous. Mm -hmm. Right. I was saying that, like, I don't think any of us are exempt, though. Like, he knew that you had a big, fancy car. Is that the first thing that you did when you seen him after 10 years? Was make sure you had a big, fancy car to go? <laughs> no, I, the first thing I did was, like, I'm all grown up now. That's what I did, too. There you go. <laughs> like, so I'm not a little girl anymore. <laughs> right. But that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about character. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about being poor, like mentally and spiritually. <laughs> if you are hanging on to this long lost love that you say you have for 20 years and the first thing that you must show her is your silk suits in your car, 
But like, let's say that, you know, you met somebody who was older and they said, oh, you don't have a college education. You know mm. what I'm saying? Like, granted, that education is very expensive. You know, you might not be able to wear it, but there still might be something that you would tote and say, oh, you know, yeah, I've got my PhD, my master's, my bachelor's. I, I don't think any of us are exempt from it. It just depends on how well you know that person and what what shakes and moves them, you know? Yeah, and maybe he thought that that's something that, you know, as a guy, he wants to show off what he's gotten to a girl, a woman or something, you know, and um, it's for guys, it's a car, it's whatever, you know, it doesn't make him, you're right, like a deep person because of that, but but I'm just thinking like, like what guys do to kind of maybe, you know, show off or impress someone mm -hmm. Especially after a while, whether it's right or wrong, Brandon, you know, but, but you know, they think like that. Time. I think we all do it, right? That's why yeah. my immediate thing was to judge him, and then I thought, like, oh my god, I am him. Like, I'm not, I am that too. Like, I overthink in those positions as well, to the point where I actually... And not only that, but he also knew that she was interested in right. being able to leave that neighborhood to be so, uh, quote-unquote, better off, right? Rich. Yeah and live a better life. So he wanted to show her, I think, that, look, I can provide that for you now. Yeah. I think it's also the question that we have to understand it. He's from the street, so there's a value system that, that it plays into this because he's from mm -hmm. that street culture. Exactly. And the street culture is the superficiality of life, you know? That's you know, right. the material things and stuff. No, um, not, well, and, not just street culture, I think, Almost every culture, every status has that kind of, you know, show off quality in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but how it manifests is dependent on where in your society you're from. So again, being from the streets, then that would be more superficial, if I can use that phrase, than with all of us who kind of try, keep it in the context, you know, of, of how life is, you know. I had said the other, earlier meeting that this was, I think the story and what Ernesto was trying to do is to speak on the question of romanticism, you know, the over-romanticizing of life. In this case, the superficiality of the material thing, both on Vera's part as well as, as um, uh, Bodega's part. Yes. He's just, he's, he's just in love, man, 20 years. <laughs> And he just wants to prove something to Vera, and he, you know, he's going for it. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, the idea of being in love with having to prove somebody wrong, right? <laughs> that, I think, is stronger than any romantic love. That idea of, like, I'm going to show you. Like, I'm going to show you you were wrong about me. Yeah, I think that too. More mm -hmm. than but do you wonder if you, if he's, in love more with just the idea of it and it's his ego that's really um motivating him or do you think he's willing to give it all up and i wonder if she's willing to give it all up just so they could be together well she definitely is um because she gave the <laughs> she gave it up already she's, she she's a cuban <laughs> <laughs> Remember, she's a, she's like a wannabe also. Yeah. But Veronica is a Vera. Yeah. And she wants to remove herself from her Puerto Rican culture. Mm -hmm. But she married a Cuban, as according to the book. I'm not, I'm not saying anything. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and, and, we, and Bodega used to be a young lord. And uh, now he's an old lord. And he's <laughs> trying to... Now he's a slum lord. <laughs> No, he's actually not. He's, he's actually not. better off than he's not. some some uh, levels we used to he have. He is. A he's where the word he used to remember? Yeah, he burned the apartment down. He's a slumlord. Kidding? Mm -hmm. And that's the poverty pick, in other words, too. Say what? I was saying an anti an anti poverty pimp. He's uh, developed his empire, but it by pimping off our poverty and and all the other things that it mentions in the in the chapters we read. Also, I wanted uh, to say, you know, somebody said we are uh, um, uh, Vera was as, aspiring for better things, but you know, once they get together, 
you kind of see like the old real Vera because they get they're drinking the champagne and acting all silly, and then you know you know the class thing comes out of them too. You know even even though in, in the beginning of introducing her, they they showed her as some kind of sophisticated person, but once she gets together with Bodega, you know the true selves sort of come out on both. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what champagne will do to you. <laughs> <laughs> They were acting like giddy, like little That's kids. for sure. And I read the whole book, so I, I have to control myself. Yeah, so I'm there with Because it's like, you, you just keep yes, giddy. don't tell us. Yeah. I'm but not, I, I, I have to slow down. <laughs> at this point in the book, at this point in the book, um, let's say we end that kind of part where they make up, they go through the champagne, what did you guys, what did you all think about Vera giving away her wedding ring? No, Brandon, and I just want to say, Brandon, I, I agree with you. Just, I was disappointed in Bodega and, and Vera. I just expected more. I, I, I would agree that, you know, a 50 year old man still talking about his clothes, <laughs> you know, those shoes. I was just disappointed. You know, like, like you're a young Lord, you have this whole big plan and, you know, this is what you bring to her. Like, this is what you're reduced to. And, and she was excited about it, you know. Exactly. And, like, you know, I, I was a little disappointed in both of them, in, in oh, the wow. character. I feel yeah. like he might, you know, oh, Lord, I hate to say this. You know how some people will set a person up to see, oh, how low will you go? You know what I'm saying? Like, I hear about those guys who are just like, Oh, I'm gonna see if she gonna do it. If she gonna, you know, some kind if of. If she sexual went low, favor. she just yeah. went low. Like. Yeah, you know, if they do some kind of sexual favor, I'm gonna just see if she do it. And then once she does it, oh, she ain't nothing but a skis or she a slut, you know, whatever the case may be. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting to see him because you know he called he called her a bitch. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, this bitch, blah 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 blah. I'm like, oh, dude, this ain't even about her. This about you. Yeah, that's why I yeah. thought it might be his ego. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, he's doing it more to satisfy his ego. I guess for those who believe that he is a slumlord, um, right. we could say that his whole character, the, at least what we have been shown in the book so far, all of his actions are about his ego in that sense. If it's not about his money, it's about the way he looks to impress a girl to really, you know, I, at first I thought he was impressing a girl that he used to fall like he fell in love with and, and used to actually care for which may be true a little bit but now that I kind of read through I think he was just his real intentions was to break up a marriage Ooh. the tea is, uh, the tea is boiling hot tonight I really think Damn, that's Brandon, <laughs> oh, Brandon. Control. <laughs> He, he liked to control things. So that would yeah, be, that's he never cool. thought about that. That he <laughs> just don't... wanted to win and control. Mm-hmm. The ego of it all, right? He didn't want Vera back. He's 50, 60 years old or something like that. He wasn't worried about that woman. He wanted to show off what he had made that she said he couldn't get and break up what happiness that she had cultivated for herself. But I digress. But he um, still wants the girl at the end. Yeah. Right? Like like a fairy tale. Mm-hmm. It's like a a, 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 a ghetto fairy tale. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I guess this is the kind of point in the book where all the characters kind of changed for me a little bit. I was wondering yeah. to see the start to change and maybe the stakes be a little higher. And I think that, I guess in round five, maybe, mm-hmm. I started to see a different part of, I don't know why, maybe it was naivete, but I thought that, I really did believe that Chino was going to just wash his hands of all of this and the rest of the story was going to be about Bodega. Um, and I was really, I guess, um, I was really, I was really shocked at the the fights that him and he and Blanca got into. Um, About they got into a few fights, right? Um, yeah. one, of, <laughs> one of them may have been a little further than what we read. 
but it was they were talking about um like the ring and if they were going to keep the yes. ring. Yes. Yes. And that I like the title. Was that, of that right book. before he showed up at at church? That was right before he showed up at the yes. church. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I thought that was a very interesting um it's almost like he, he just wants to be like cathartic and, mm -hmm. and it's just not, he's only allowing himself bits and pieces. He doesn't know how much to pour out. Mm. I don't know who made the connection about the Palladian there. Probably nobody because you're too young. <laughs> <laughs> I not just like the young. titles, you know, the titles are great. They bring back, well, I never danced at the Palladium, but, uh, you know, I know a lot about it. And um, she was a whore. <laughs> she was a whore, and he was trying to, you know, placate the whore. She likes, she likes rings. She gave her ring up, but she wanted something more than a ring. Mm. So, you know, I don't like her. Are you talking about Vera? Yeah. Oh, I thought you were talking about Blanca. Um, no, no. Blanca. Yeah, I know. I Blanca. was trying to make the connection. Are you talking about what the pastor at the church was preaching about? Robert Vega. <laughs> yeah. Who the young kid? The young. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Remember all that whole spiel he was going mm -hmm. on and on about. Uh, how that was. Yeah, that was a little after the argument that he and Blanca. Right, had. right. When he met her at oh, the yeah. church, they just started listening to him. Remember? But well, I Blanca didn't get further than that, so I was wondering if Anna Vasquez was talking about making the connection between his feel and the Palladium. Well, the in r round four, the title of that that uh, whatever chapter is called Palladium Diamond or the diamond, the Palladian diamond or something. Uh -huh. So it's all about how she gives up the, the ring and then <clears throat> Blanca and Chino have the fight that she doesn't, you know, she doesn't want the ring or whatever. And then he goes to church and he's saved because Blanca is more in tune to what's going on with the, with the young hallelujah guy. Yeah. The hallelujah, right? <laughs> the pastor, yeah. So it kind of gets buried in the background. Well, let's talk about fish. Somebody in the chat brought up fish? Um, the right. fish of Loisaida. Yeah. That's and the issue with the reporter round being three. killed yeah. and everything. Yeah, Salazar. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting take. You want to talk more about that, Emory? Yeah, mean? yeah. I thought that was um, like it. It all kind of took me by surprise when I found out that um, Sapo was in jail. Yeah, well, Sapo was in jail. Yeah, I thought he's he in did. jail. Oh, he's somewhere, right? He's missing. He's missing. Yeah, he's, I he's thought hiding. he was in jail. No, he's in hiding. Remember? He, okay. He's Okay. <clears throat> but, I don't want to mess it up for you. That's wrapped around Salazar. Yes. See, okay. Yeah. But nobody's in jail yet. Nobody's in jail. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not <Yeah>. yet. <laughs> you That's know, right. we talked about, about a couple weeks ago with this idea of like having different types of currencies, if you will, different ways, like oh, the power yeah. someone a favor. And I think that I kind of really saw that play out like I think it was in round five mm -hmm. when Blanca asked you know, to uh, help Negra get Victor beat up by Bodega or somebody Bodega knows. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I, I was like, oh, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the power of a <laughs> and you're in this position where it's, it's not as cut and dry as money. Right, it's not as cut and dry as like either you pay it or you don't. Right. You there's so many moving parts, right, and it's such a complex way 
of, of organizing your debts, right? When, they, when you know, there is no real currency involved. And I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that a lot and, that, and how when they got into that fight, you know, he kind of painted the picture that they, this is right before they went to the church, by the way. He kind of painted this picture where they were, they were just ice cold to each other, Chino mm -hmm. and Blanca, weren't even speaking in the house. You know, he mm -hmm. said some strangers would have had like more words for each other in the streets. Yeah. And I think that, <clears throat> I think that kind of just going back to that idea and, and right before he go, gets to the church, and he's he's really battling this idea of like, damn, am I gonna help like Negra out? Like it's a it's it would almost be a an easy yes for a for perhaps somebody else in that position, but he knows how high the stakes are. Mm -hmm. If I, Negra, and it's, it's like he he knows that the moment he throws that hook in, that's it. And he's been wanting to wash his hands of this for so long. Yeah. What I'm talking about when I'm talking about when you build you know, debt and favors, you yes. build so many webs, right? And mm -hmm. it's so hard to get out once you're in it. Yep. It's all possible. It's all a part of the web of lies, right? Mm -hmm. Well, has he been lost? Well, I, by I, feel like, I feel like, though, in that particular instance, I feel like Chino didn't really skip a beat, though. Like, I, I felt like... I felt like his understanding of that particular situation gave him a leg up. And I know we talked about this a little bit last week in terms of why um, Nazario, wait, no, not Nazario. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, Bodegas, is it Nazario? Who's the lawyer? Nazario. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I was confusing him with the person who was killed, the reporter. Um, uh, like the fact that they're seeking him out, right? Um, it, I think it speaks to Chino's ability to live in both worlds. And I think Americo talked about this last last week, and it, it resonated a lot with me as I read these um, this section. Chino's uh, ability, his like duality, right? Like he does. I feel like he does have his foot in in both worlds, so to speak, right? And so the re like that 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 tension between wanting to move forward, but also still having your foot in, you know, the things that you want to kind of get away from. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in that particular instance, when he heard, when he found out that um, uh, a Negro was asking for this favor, he knew all those connections and somehow he was able, he's like, okay, I know what's going on here. And he was able to, to let Blanca know, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not getting involved in their, their marital mm -hmm. affairs. Like he was able to navigate his way out of there, even to the point where he also knew how to get back into good graces with Blanca, right? Let me go to church with her, <laughs> right? Let's, let's get back to where we, he's, he, he is very crafty. He knows how to move within any and every situation to get to where he needs to be. And I think that's why um, Bodega, and um, Nosario are seeking after him, right? He can, yeah. he, he can play in both worlds successfully. Mm -hmm. He's a college kid. And it's, does he want to? I don't believe he wants to. I, this is the thing, I agree with you 100%. I think Bodega and Nosario see something in, you know, young Chino that they once probably saw in themselves. And I think that to them, they're like, oh, let's snatch that up. Let's cultivate that talent. But I think to Chino, he's like, oh, no, no, no. Like, I think he wants off. to. I think he wa either he wants to or he's really torn. Because mm -hmm. when, when, when he came to get picked up, when they said, well, I don't know. I think Nazario was like, okay, I need you. And he was like, okay, I'm there. Like, you know, it's almost as if it was laying dormant in him and he was trying to push it aside. And then when the opportunity presented itself, I, I feel like he didn't struggle as much anymore as he did in the beginning because he was just, okay, let me just release whatever I already have inside me here because he's been struggling, struggling between the two worlds. And he even mentioned it. Is it the world that he wants with Blanca, right? Like when, they, when he was talking or thinking about what Nazario was trying to offer him or he was thinking about this world, this life that he has with Blanca and he was thinking about this life, this world that Bodega is presenting, right? And he, he's torn between the two. Um, I, I don't know. I feel like he does, you know, he does kind of want it. He does see the value in it. There's conflict there. There's, there's yeah, a lot there's of conflict. There's definitely conflict. I agree. Yeah.
I, I want to think about this idea, though. He was with it until, like, I, I agree with you. I think he sees his vision clear. And I think he knew what he wanted out of the, uh, out of the whole deal. He wanted an apartment, like, for his wife and his kids. Yeah. To get out the projects. And once that was done, once that deal was done, he I thought he, he could just step out. No, yeah. he knows that deal is never done. He knows it's never done. <laughs> those deals are never done. There those, you go. Deals are, those deals go for life, for generations. His children will owe Bull David. <laughs> <laughs> like his grandchildren, his great grandchildren, 15 ancestors down the line will yeah, owe Bull David's still, kids. He Lydia, knows that. No. You know why? He's aware. Because his loyalty to Sapo is built on that very philosophy that he owes him because Sapo had protected him so much yeah. in school that he knew he owed him. So you are absolutely right about that. Yeah. Chino yeah. knows the streets. He yeah. knows the streets. Yeah. And Mariko, I think you're saying, trying to say something. You're on mute. And we all want to hear what you have to say, all of us. Please. Can't read lips. <laughs> oh, you're still you, on mute. You're muted, Americo. Americo, you're trying to work two devices. Just focus on your camera. He can't hear you. Can you unmute him? You can unmute him. Yeah. Oh, there he goes. Oh, no, he's not. Americo. Turn the volume up, Americo. No, he doesn't have, he doesn't have the, the mute. He's unmuted. Right? Yeah, he's unmuted. Yeah, but, well, I'll, I'll work with America. You guys just continue. <laughs> he's unmuted. That's why I keep the conversation. He's a tech yeah. guy. Sorry, America, que pasa? He'll figure it out. Um, yeah. I told him in the chat that he's muted. He just needs to turn the volume up on his computer. Yeah. There he is. Is that it? No. Yes, it's something, something going on. But anyway, y'all did y'all. This is difficult because can't I can't hear Brandon oh. now. Oh, you can't hear me? No, yeah, we no, can't I hear Brandon. No, we hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start trouble, Anna. Um, That's my middle name. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I guess that I'm really curious to kind of talk to y'all about is the idea of like justice being served. The idea of like street justice and if it is as fair and as noble and as um, maybe monitored, I guess, as judicial justice. Oh. He's answering the question, but we still can't hear him. <laughs> He's not here. Can hear you. And more specific. Just, what was the question? Uh, like the fire that was started in retaliation for the, the newspaper guy, being, the journalist being murdered. Like, yeah. that's what I'm talking about, street justice, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because Nazario's a lawyer, right? Yeah. I mean, he could have taken that to the courts in the judicial matter, like. Oh come on! But he couldn't, right? Because it was, <laughs> it was a... come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you want to say? I'm sorry. No, no. no. <laughs> I'm just a product of white flight and and the burning of buildings in the '70s. So come on. No, but he. But he, the thing about it is, yeah, he could have. But Nazario's from the streets. He. He could have he could have done that. He had the intellect, he had the the access because of his career pathway. But I also think that he knows that that that's there's no there wouldn't have been any real honor in that in the streets either, right? Like I think Nazario, he's from the streets. He knows how he knows that life. He knows it. Yeah, but that was a retaliation for killing the the jerk, the reporter Salazar. Right, and he's aware of that. Oh, he knows, tit he knows, right? Tit for tat, right? Street justice. That's it. Yeah, that's like, they don't talk, they don't hint on that a lot, right? It's almost as wow. if it is as legit or even maybe even more solidified or maybe more permanent than judicial justice. 
What's more permanent fire? And I think especially, ooh, am I, my connection's a little off. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, so especially since, and, and I think there was this undercurrent um, that, you know, uh, Quinones has in terms of everything is just passing, right? Like, there's no real spotlight on the community. Like, they know that the story is just going to kind of go away, so to speak, right? So will there be a, another form of justice? I think that I think that in their community, they're saying to themselves, we have to take matters into our own hands, right? Like no one is really paying attention to us. So we have to take care of things the way that we have to take care of them. And I think that mm. Nazario is able to, to, you know, again, he spots something in Chino that is like him, like what he's able to do. And this is what he wants to create. He wants to create you know, a nation of individuals who can be fluid in that sense, that can operate above the law and operate below it, because right. I think that gives a sense of power in both places. Right. Precisely. Does anyone else want to chime in there? Well, just justice for whom? For people of color, that doesn't exist. So, you know, even to today. So what is justice? What is legal? What is not legal? Come on now. And so for example, Lydia, when you're talking about like that idea of like being from the streets and like getting justice in the way that you desire, I not only thought about that, you know, with the fire and the retaliation and the journalists, but I also thought about that even in the sense of Negra calling in her favor, right? She could have easily called the NYPD, but she didn't. She went to a different form of justice, right? <laughs> something that was more comfortable, <laughs> something that was going to be more comforting, something that she knew would get her results, right? Yeah. So, like, that's kind of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about kind of developing that idea of street justice <laughs> versus like judicial justice, which they ha also have in Nazario. It's not like there isn't anyone here who is just completely removed. Like, these are layered people, you know? So, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about like, different ideas of, of justice. And I think, I think, like you said, Brandon, I mean, I don't want to use the word subculture, but it's a culture within, within a culture. So when yeah. you know, you know, that, <clears throat> you know, everybody's talking about that you're not going to get justice, you, you start to create your own rules and figure out your own system of dealing with things and mm -hmm. figuring out how things are going to work. And like you said, she, um, you know, Negra just couldn't really call the police because her husband was beating her up. So she had to figure out, you know, another way or just, you know, yeah. certain things just open up. In, in many ways, the police aren't even an option. It's right. like, oh, you right. take care of this yourself. Yeah. Right. There's, there's right. no, there's, there's no 911 on my phone. That's right. You, <laughs> right. you know, you, you yeah. have to deal with it no, yourself. True. Yeah. True. I mean, don't you remember when she stabbed him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Just let's just, let's go back to that. Him. Who <laughs> called the cops? Nobody called the cops. He fell on the knife, right, Anna? He the knife managed to touch him. <laughs> no, okay. Remember when they went to the hospital? He was like, "If anyone asked, I fell." Like, yeah. Like that. Like he said, "I fell on the knife." I was like, <laughs> "He was. He really? was even protecting her." Yeah. You know. But, yeah. Like. Yes, mm. it's like that. That's not the way they move. Yeah. Right. That, yeah. So that's my idea, right? He was even mm -hmm. protecting her, but well, who was he protecting her from? The police. His right? girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> but but <laughs> you know, but it's also protecting him. Yes. Because remember, they call the police, the police investigate. It's a crime of passion. Why? Because he's having an affair. Yes. Donnie right? Brass. What a horrible movie to have an affair to. Sidebar. But, yeah. Yeah. Donnie yeah. Brasco was one of the best movies. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> that was random. Donnie Brasco was really good. That was a random movie, right? To pick, to have yeah. an affair. But, <laughs> appropriate. Yeah. I think also, kind of that idea of, so not even justice for crimes like that, right? A fire. Um, a, a stabbing um, or domestic, any type of domestic abuse, but also I feel like all of the people in the story, everybody kind of takes matters into their own hands 
even the saved, sanctified, and washed in the blood, Blanca and Claudia, like they were 100% willing to, they probably didn't even, we didn't even get a sense that they thought twice about it, uh, kind of manipulating the system to get Claudia a green card. They were like, yeah, just find somebody for her to marry. Yeah. Take yeah. so, taking, taking the opportunities into your own hands and not waiting for, for these kind of like pillars of like government and federal like structure. And then what did you think of that? Do you think she was a hypocrite? Uh, this is the question I'm proposing to oh, you. Okay. <laughs> I would say, um, yes. It's time, time, right? Because well, how else is Claudia going to get a green card? That's oh. right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, this is Kagiso. I, I think she was a realist, and I agree with everything that you know people are saying that you, you can't rely on, um, the police or the fire department, or the garbage men, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the courts, because they didn't exist, they don't exist now. So you have, so you have to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. That's it, you know? That's and so I, so I didn't think that was being a hypocrite, that was being a realist. Yeah. You know, in, in, in saying, well, I gotta do it my way. We have to do it our way, you know, so. And you don't want to send your husband or your boyfriend to jail, really. That's the last thing any of us wanted in those days. Mm -hmm. I don't that's, know. A really, that's a really important point. Or visit him in Rikers. You know, come on. <laughs> this is idea from Casita Maria. I just want to welcome you all. Um, and I'm, I'm loving hearing this. I also want to recognize the Casa Promesas on the call. So we have our amazing um, elders from the community uh, listening in and, you know, hopefully Ooh. they can chime in too. Um, but I, I guess, you know, one of the things I was sort of trying to connect the dots on this book was really the, the sort of male thread that I see going through it, right? And I, I'm, I'm seeing all these like male characters in the book and they're, um, you know, they're trying to survive El Barrio, right? Which yeah. is, there's like, there's no book there, but there is street code. And I see, um, mm -hmm. you know, men trying to go down different routes to survive, you know, to be successful, to find yeah. love, to find success, right? All these things that are um, the values of, of, of the dominant culture, right? Capitalism yep. and money and wealth and all that, but, you know, <laughs> under certain conditions. And so... I see them sort of going the route of like violence and murder and drugs and dealing drugs or women or trying to get an education or maybe it's religion or maybe the crime route, right? Maybe it's politics, right. um, the young lords, like community organizations. And so I just really see how- There's a lot of entry points, right? Or men to sort of map and navigate manhood when the messages are so distorted and then they have distorted notions of manhood. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sad for all of them. Right. I'm really, really sad for all of them. I don't want to victimize them, whether they're, you know, doing one thing or the other. I'm like, how, how do you do this as a man? How do you survive? Right. And for women, it's, it's, an, it's, it's the same question, but I think as I read the book, I'm feeling more compassion than anger and other things for them because that's that's not easy to come out of that community alive from a East Harlem resident, by the way. Yeah. I feel neither way. I don't feel compassion nor do I dislike them. I just think they're cool. <laughs> I like them all. <laughs> it's a way of life. Yeah. And it's actually very true to form. Yeah. So, you know, this is what happened back in the 70s. So did you decide the decade that it was? You said, what was that movie? Roscoe? That yeah. came out in 1997. Yeah, right. I thought it was the 90s. It was the 90s. It was the late 90s. 90s. Right? Yeah. It was the 90s. Yeah, because there's cell phones yes. already. Oh, wow. They have cell phones already. Uh, hey. 1997 was when Donnie Brasco came up because I looked it up because I remembered we were talking wow. about the time period of the book and I was like well that kind of makes a lot of sense because yeah. remember 
uh, Willy Bodega <laughs> is reminiscing of his time with the Young Lords. Yeah, but, so it couldn't yeah. have been that 70s. it was in the 70s. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm, and he's the 90s. Okay. much older than Chino. Yeah. The 90s. Okay. Because remember, this is Blanca's aunt, right? So Mira, it has to yeah. be a couple of decades older. Oh. Precisely. Right? Makes sense? No? The 90s. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay. but definitely are the oldest. And then Chino and Sappho. Mm -hmm. But I, I appreciate the point that Haiti was making, Ivy, about all the different, uh, I was thinking of like all the different entry points mm -hmm. of people trying to survive. And um, yeah, they're, they, it's like any which way, right? By any means necessary, kind of. Okay. <laughs> Malcolm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they got to do it any way they can. Yeah. yeah. But it was after 1997 too, because Chino tells, <laughs> Chino tells um, uh, Bodega and Vera, you know that, they closed the Palladium down, right? They closed yes. down. That closed down in 97. So yeah. it is yeah. the late 90s. Yeah. 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 Yes. I thought it closed down before. OK. Yeah. Can somebody talk to me about the Palladium? Maybe a Bronx native, Heather? Yeah. <laughs> Tito Puente, Tito Rodriguez, and Machito. That's all you need to know. That was <laughs> <good>. <laughs> Break dancing was invented in the Palladium. Actually, it was not. It was across the street from the Palladium. But there's a guy, Joe Conzo, who used to have a class at Hostos about Latin music. And he's actually going to do it virtual starting in Joe, October. Joe Conzo Sr. Sr., right, because the son is the photographer, mm -hmm. the hip hopster. But, <clears throat> yeah, and he just, you know, you see these videos of Tito Rodriguez Dancing on this wooden floor like he's break dancing. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so you hear that mambo music, the mambo where everybody would just dance on weekdays. You know, they go from work, they put on their heels, they dance all night. And meet me on the dance floor. Yeah. That was the true happy hour. <laughs> yes. That's, yeah. And there were, there were places like that up and down the Bronx and Manhattan and I'm sure the other boroughs, which don't count as far as I'm concerned. No, I'm I, know, I know that every year Casita Maria does a tour, the South Bronx cultural tour. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they, they, a lot of places, they're, they're now Dwayne Reed's yeah. and places like that. But Hard originally time, they right? were theaters. They were yeah. big theaters and dance yes. halls. Yeah. yeah. And that and that goes the history of what you're talking about is also the history of how the Caribbean black people come to here because Palladium all that comes from the birth of Afro Cuban music coming to the United States. Yeah, right. Afro Cuban, right. Salsa, Machito. Both of salsa is how do we have the people from that industry, how do we keep this going during the Cuban Revolution? So the, the advent of the marketing phrase salsa and the and the Afro Cuban music of, People would type Zelsky work, which is not the case. True. And so Puerto Ricans follow the Cubans in terms of the culture. So when we come here, we from enjoying our musical culture, which is completely different than Cuba, and when you go to the you know, master places, it was the Cuban music community that was dominant in those areas. So, and then when, you know, when Dizzy and the jazz greats meet the Cuban music, and then the evolution which is just another label for Apple Cuban music. Yeah. Thank you, America, Marco. America is making a, a cameo. Thank you, America. Yeah, Thank you. I used to go better. to the Palladium and other, you know, groups like this is Caguiso. Um, yeah. and other groups like and other places like that and i it was just thinking back on it you had uh, latinos you know mostly puerto ricans right. and african americans together you know and i wish you know that just stayed you know just to see our commonality 
and people will be dancing and having a great time. And, yeah. um, and so white it people was good. too. It was Everybody great. Everybody was yeah. going. Mm -hmm. It was party. It was mm -hmm. decked out. Nice. Do you have any other memories of the Palladium before we? Uh, Google it. Check it out. Well, you only oh, have an old yeah. person like me, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All these but goodies. <laughs> I fell coming down the steps inside the Palladium. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> but let me tell Girl, you. Girl, who did it? must have been a baby. <laughs> Con eso tacone. Who's not oh going to fall? God. I must have fallen a million times. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that night. <laughs> when you weren't drinking. <laughs> oh no! Me drinking now. <laughs> so it was a fun time. It was a fun era. Yeah. And it's it was no longer, fun. unfortunately. Did? Yeah, it seems like. So I guess I just missed that. I didn't understand why they had named the. Uh, I meant to look it up. I didn't understand why they named that chapter a ring bigger than the Palladium. But now I. I see. The Palladium must have just been like a massive. Yes. Yes. Beautiful. What do you all? What do? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, what? What do? Um, what does any everyone think about the conversation that he had with Blanca about the ring? Because that really set the tone for like what happens in like the next couple of scenes where just I'm just gonna drop this in here I think he's a massive Ooh. manipulator Ooh. he's very manipulative oh and so um what's his name Chino oh uh, Chino okay yeah, I agree yeah I agree. remember he gets into an argument with her about the ring and he only shows a very like real side of who he is because he's he's just a funny character he, when he doesn't get what he wants. He wants the ring. And as soon as he doesn't get it, he starts to like show his claws. And that's when like what he's really thinking drops. But for the most part, part he's been pathologically lying to her the whole damn time. I don't know. That That's my take on it. I'm just curious as to what everyone else thinks about that particular scene when they're arguing about the ring. Yes, I brought that up earlier and I don't think we got to it. If you have like the actual book, it's um, the start of round five, which is page 129, 128. And that's interesting you say that he was, he was being manipulative. I guess I thought maybe I was thinking more along in those terms of like survival and, and just like doing whatever you need to do to kind of get a nest egg, however you can get it. Um, because he was trying to, to pawn the ring, right? To like pay a few months rent. Um, and I guess I kind of, I don't know if I saw that. I, I see what you're saying now, but when I was reading it, I guess I, I was on his side. I was like, yes, pawn the ring, you know, and like get the money for it. What's um, wrong with that? No, I don't think anything's wrong with it. I think she, they should have kept the ring and pawned it. I don't think nothing's wrong with that situation. You give me the ring, it's my fucking ring. So what Hello. I choose to do with it is my business. You know what I mean? So, yeah, <laughs> I don't think I'm nothing's about. wrong with it. Yeah. Pero him particular, you know what it is? Is that, you know, from day one, I've had an issue with him and Willy Bodega. But he, I noticed his interactions with her are so manipulative, manipulative, that yeah. word, because I can't yeah, even get yeah. it out right now. <laughs> <laughs> Manipulative, I know. Arda, I just see where just you're use your French <laughs> words. <laughs> right. <laughs> it breaks up the monotony. Marta, yes. You, like, if no. that's the thing, yeah, he should have just no. said to try, instead of trying to, like, manipulate around it to get her to try to say that it was her idea, even though that's what the idea he's going to fight for anyway. <laughs> Yeah, but the manipulation has right, to and then he's worlds. not because he's in one world and he's in the other world. He has to go back and forth. The world that that's his wife, which is not the street, the street that he came of, and the link with the Gestapo, which is the link to the street, and at the same time, he's to get away from that. I think, as an author, but 
but the whole thing trying to do is present the paradox of trying to do all that. Mm -hmm. I agree. I definitely agree that he's definitely dealing with like having to deal with both worlds but he also chooses when he wants to be truthful with her right he's he's very careful and the lies when they come out they're almost immediate you know like when she asked him um what what was it she asked him like oh do you know nazario he was like no you know like it's just there's something very manipulative about him and his interactions with her. And, but, but I totally understand what America was saying that he is, you know, he's like the paradox. He's in between two worlds. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think it also has a lot to do with her. Like she's, she, and I, I think we brought it up in the first discussion where she sits on this high horse, like, wait a minute, you know, and yes, extremely yeah. <clears throat> self-righteous, like with the ring. Yeah. Like we were saying just a minute ago, that ring was given to her. Okay, fine. She gave it to she gave it to Chino and and oh, she doesn't want it because this, that, and the other was given with a promise. Put that on, put that damn thing on your finger and rock it. Or like he said, <laughs> pawn it, you know, pawn and, and pay some rent. Oh no, give it back. It's his ring. No, it's not. He gave it to her. And so it's like she has this, and and I think that's why he's. And he, I think he said yeah. it. I lie to you or I keep you in the dark because it's going to be a big argument all the time. Right, right, right. At least he admitted that. Oh. You know, at least that's gaslighting. <laughs> that's gaslighting at his best. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. He was gaslighting her when he said that. Nah, it's her a... fault that he's lying. Imagínate. Oh, it's your <laughs> fault that I'm lying to you. <laughs> No, but I don't think, I, I don't know. I don't, if you think I don't, about it, though, ella jode mucho. Exactly. You know? I don't think so. I think, uh, you know, with the, like, <laughs> if it's always going to be a fight, you know what? Let me, let me go with the road of least resistance. Because it's, yeah. Because, like, she sits on this high horse and this dad, and, and he's like, oh, boy. Well, a lot of religious people do that. Remember, what, is, what are the Christians tied to? ethics of the Christianity. So that's where she's coming from. I know he has to deal with that. So if he tries to deal with it the way he grew up and the way he sees the world, there's gonna be a clash in the marriage. And he's trying. Mm -hmm. Precisely. So I see that clash happening uh, multiple times in the book between them. And for example, when the, the situation about the ring for sure, but also it was, I think it was just his internal dialogue, but he even said, there's no way I'm going to Bodega to ask him to beat up Victor. That is 100% not happening. So it's this, however, he was down to like pawn Blanca's aunt's ring with no problem, you know, but he was, so he, he does pick and choose, right? When he uh, wants to be decidedly street and when he wants to be as fair as Blanca would like him to be. But Blanca's like that too. Blanca says that, like, no, she made a promise to God, and she, now she broke that promise. Let her deal with the ring. However, she has no problem forging those marriage papers to get Claudia a green card. So they're both... <laughs> Girl! Right? They're both, and they don't see how one is just as equal as the other. That's what it feels like. It feels like they are judging each other without even knowing they're judging each other. That's true. But I think Chino is, is um, besides being manipulative, I think he's naive. You know, mm. he doesn't, he doesn't really um, see what the implications are to take a ring or to even give his, um, you know, to do what Bodega wants him to do or to do what Sapo wants him to do. He, he doesn't take, get the big picture, I don't think, you know. I think he thinks he's above it all. Like yeah. that he, yeah, he's just better than, I, I don't know if necessarily he's better than everybody, but that, you know, he, he already gets away with things. You know, he gets to be taken out of class to do art. He gets this beautiful Blanca. He just always, like, his life just kind of falls together for him. So I don't even know if he doesn't realize the implications as much as he just, I don't know, some people are just like that. Like their life just ends up really well no matter what. Yeah, Rachel, I completely agree. It was like, like 
the minute he found out that Nasari, no, um, Bodega needed him or, or wanted something from him, um, it was like he knew that he can get away with things that, you know, um, because he, of his relation with the woman's niece that, you know, it's such, it sounds such, like such a distant relation, but he knows that he's the connection for Bodega and Vera. And Bodega took advantage of that too. I remember in like the first few pages that we read, Bodega, wasn't he at the, I could be wrong about this, but wasn't Bodega at the auditorium introducing Chino like as his, his nephew or, or something like that, like to make it seem like they were family? So Bodega was playing that card too, right? Like play him close, play him as close as you can because you need him. I just think that Bodega is more seasoned and he's better at doing it than Chino is right now. Yes. I see parallels between Bodega and Chino throughout the whole book. Um, it's just like Chino is like a very young version. Even the way how he's in love with Blanca, you can see the parallel between how Chino is, I mean, uh, Bodega is in love with uh What's her name? Viera? Vera? Vera. Vera. I think he's just like a younger version of what of Bodega. Yeah, and I don't know if we read this like what part we're on, but I know he and Sapo have like a conversation about Blanca, and he's just like, "You like Blanca because she's white. Like you like white girls." Some it was some conversation Sapo had with him, like, it was, but it was like a real conversation, like. You know, you always want something that's above everybody else. I, I don't remember what page that conversation was on, or I, I don't have the book in front of me, but I, I remember that conversation they had. And he kind of called him out. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, you know, yeah, the dilemma is, you know, it's also within within Latino culture, the the, the subtleness of, of dealing with race. Right. Uh, and I think he's trying to, and that's what's trying to, show that within the context of the story too, without taking away his main focus, which is this ongoing dilemma about which way do you go with life? Do you go like the street world that he once knew and grew up with, or do you go from his idyllic point of view of what progress is, going to the university, getting the job, then you can buy the house. So, um, you know, I think Ernesto is trying to bring the whole contradiction of Latino culture within the story. I can, I can under, I can definitely see that point. However, I think that he definitely chooses Ernesto. He definitely chooses which which version to highlight. I know we're always reading these paragraphs about how Blanca and Chino are going to class, or they gotta, they can't go sacrifice a chicken with you right now because they have to go to class or whatever. We're always hearing that, but we don't really see their. See their class. School seems like a, an afterthought for both of them. So it seems like they have both decided which world that they are going to thrive in. Usually the streets are your backup plan and college is your main focus. It seems like in this, the, the, their community is their main focus and their schooling is, is a backdrop. No, I, I would disagree. The school is because they're the only two going to school. Everybody else in the story is is not moving that way so you're you're in the community setting because they're in the middle of this life trying to get out are they and trying to stop they rent a, an apartment from bodega though but you oh. know I, I i'm not sure but right i think too I, I don't know i went to college like away so i went to college in virginia so we like we were more isolated but i'm thinking if i went to college in new york like all my friends that went to college at like St. John's, they were more in the city. Like they were still studying, but it just seems like they were more like out and about in New York more so than me just because we were like when you're on campus, I don't, I don't know if I'm making sense. Like if you're on campus, you don't have that much time. Whereas if you're in the city, like, that's why it seems like they're not doing work because they're in school in New York. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, I went to school in New York, and it was a backdrop. Right. You know, like it was. Oh, okay, right. Mm -hmm. it was that. So I don't know. I think about that often, right? And I think about like, is he really trying to escape 
this life if he rents from the person that he will be indebted to, like we said, 15 ancestors into? How, how, how are you trying to get out? So I thought about that a lot in that sense. That but it's a good deal, though. <laughs> Well, all deals with the devil are good, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Every last one of them. <laughs> but does so, he realize? Does he realize that he's going to be indebted to um, Bodega for well, the rest of his life? We talked about it. Yeah, he has it. He has to remember, and he's very hypocritical too, because when Blanca oh, wants okay. a favor from <laughs> Negra, oh, he's. Oh, Hello? Uh, go ahead, Martha. Oh, sorry. When, when Blanca wants a favor, um, and he's like, oh, don't get into any favors with Negra because you're going to owe her for the rest of your life. But you can't see <laughs> right. that what you're doing with Willy Bodega is going to lead you into that. And move favor. Like, he's, he's, he's fooling himself. <laughs> I feel like he's fooling himself, or he's trying to fool us. Yeah. But I, you can't fool me. I yeah. think owing, I think for him, um, Owing Negra isn't worth the work as owing Willy Bodega. Like Ooh. he gets a two bedroom apartment at cheaper rate than he would in, in NYCHA. You know, he, he mm -hmm. gets you know, respect just from association with Nazario. Um, you know, he can use him and it's like, like, I think it was a part where, where Bodega told him to do something and he was like, um, I don't, we're family now, or since you need me, you need to speak to me a certain kind of way. And he was like, can you please do this for me? And so he was like, all right, fine. So I think owing Negras to him in his mind is more work than it's worth. The payoff is not as big as Bodega. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And it's just messier, right? At least with Bodega, he can just pay him his rent and move on with his life, right? Right, right. Right. With Negra, it's just messy. It's a messy favorite. And Negra's messy. family. I mean, she can she can crunch him in ways that Bodega cares nothing about. She would have leverage with Blanca. And she's a woman. And yeah, very. Wait, who said that woman part? Oh, yeah. Me. And she's a woman. Like, nobody, there's nobody who's been, yeah, there's no one who's been equal to him. Like, that's had a, been able to have a, a a, a deep conversation with Tino or uh, any of the other people at all. Like, they're all women, so ergo, they have to be in the backdrop. Who cares about what women think, really, other, unless you want something, you know what I'm saying? So, like, nobody, I, like, I've never, I've never even heard them talk about their mothers in any deep conversations with them. It's just all any serious conversations between men, so why would it? Because a man wrote it? That's really interesting. A man did write it, but that's also very interesting just in the cultural sense. Oh yeah. I guess the main characters that are female in here, except Blanca. Yeah. I guess the, I can't think about her as a main character. I don't know why. Uh, but I think he has very like intense conversations with Blanca. I see his emotion come out only when he's talking to Blanca. Mm -hmm. That's the only time I really see any change in him. I guess I'm tracking Chino's change through how he relates to Blanca, scene by scene by scene. Otherwise, he's very static to me. Hmm. It seems like he's growing with Blanca. It doesn't seem like he's growing in any other relationships, though. Let me, uh, let me pose it like this. Do you think that an elementary school, uh, kind of the relationship that he has with Sapo, do you think that that is is as developed as it is once men get to a certain age, regardless of how long they've known each other, once they get to a certain age that inevitably will divide them, do you think that that relationship has grown as much as it can? And now that man can only grow more, you know, in an intimate relationship? Does that make sense? <laughs> Go ahead, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have other men here tonight, so I'm just kind of... <laughs> For the first time we have, oh, uh, I think they bailed on us. Well, Americo's still here. So. Americo's trying, but he's been in and out, like. I said. And Shaq is here. Oh, Shaq. Shaq, I Shaq said, say something, Shaq. <laughs> represent, represent. 
I just been listening, trying to remember a lot. I have read yeah. this book probably like about ten years ago. Oh, yeah, so I'm trying to like remember it. You didn't reread it for the group? Eh, no. He just found <laughs> out about it yesterday. <laughs> Hold on, though. Hold on. Shaq, is that Shaq talking? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess my question doesn't really have anything to do with the book. Maybe you can so maybe you can answer the question in these terms, like. Mm -hmm. Of Chino and Sapo, their relationship started firmly in elementary school, and once they kind of went to adulthood, they both went in two different directions. So yeah. my feeling is that the relationship has grown as much as it's going to grow, and so the only relationship that kind of will grow Chino as a person, as a man, is going to have to be the relationship that he has with with Blanca, who is his significant other. And I'm yeah. guessing, wondering, does that make sense? Do you see what I'm saying in that sense? Uh, I think so because there's more debt in terms of going through life with Blanca than with the, the people from his street culture. He's already outgrown that. And so and this is his wife also. We gotta, you know, keep okay. she's just not another woman in the in the storyline. She is his wife. That's right. Mm-hmm. So you're saying Ryan, you're saying that say that his connection to her is deep, I, I hope, and it feels like it is deeper than his connections to the street. Because- I'll, I'll propose this to you then. How, like, uh, anytime to me, anytime he, Sapo has asked Chino for something, he has done it. Anytime Blanca has asked Chino for something, it has been an argument. Oh, that's different. That's yeah, different. I think that is different. I think that's the dynamics of being Married. in a relationship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just, mm -hmm. you just got to tussle. <laughs> oh, come on. Men like to fight. Women like to fight. It's just life. What did, you say, what did you say, Barbara? I said men like to fight. Women like to fight. Oh, okay. That's yeah. Life. Like we just, you know, in a relationship, yeah. it's you know, the fun battle going back and forth. Not, yeah. I'm talking about is like growth in character development, life, man, selfhood development, right? I think you're only, only going to go as far as, as your association takes you. And so I think with Blanca, whatever she may be, I think the fact that she, she wants to grow. So mm. she's, going to gr she's going to bring him with her. Sapo's not growing himself. So how can you grow with someone or help someone else grow when it's almost like, um, Chino is outgrowing Sapo just by wanting right. to, to, you know, to just move out of the neighborhood or not even move out of, you know, he's not the one that wants to move. Blanca is the one that wants to move out of the neighborhood. But, you know, by going to college, by, you know, and Sapo's a cool dude, but you know what? He's, he's gotten to his, his goalpost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and they are, they are committed to doing this together, even though they are kind of budding they are both, they, um, Blanca and Chino, are, are both trying to better themselves. Mm -hmm. And it almost feels like the natural outcome of that would be to separate yourself from Nazario and Sapo and the, and the neighborhood in general. It's, it's almost like West Side Story. Um, Chino and Maria, they're trying to break away from the culture, from from the bad, from the good, but whatever, you know, and the streets are always going to talk. Yeah. Do you owe any loyalty to the streets when you grow up in them? Do you owe any loyalty of to course. your... Of course. I think it's so. Like, yeah. Back in the day you did. Yes, you did. But, and, it, and again, it depends on where you grow up at, but I definitely think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting, Ron. Can you talk a little more about that? Yeah. Uh, I happen to be in my old neighborhood over the weekend. And uh, it, it's changed somewhat. I grew up on 163rd and Trinity Avenue. Um, but I still see <laughs> this kind of like the same people there doing the same thing, sitting on the same benches. And I don't know what it is, but I still feel connected to, even though I don't want to sit on the bench with them. <laughs> I kind of have this organic feeling. <laughs> I have this organic feeling about the people in that neighborhood mm -hmm. and I I feel like no matter where I go and I'm not that I'm still in the Bronx but 
far from that neighborhood, I still feel connected to them. And I understand what it is to deal with the police and to deal with, to live in below standard housing and to have to walk uh, multiple blocks to find fresh fruit and things like that. So, which is kind of a myth, but. Uh, and I, I, still, I still see it all around that neighborhood. Yeah. And I just feel just as comfortable as, you know, like I never left. I have a question. What did, I feel like uh, the Jay-Z thing and where they, people were asking him to buy Marcy or to invest more <laughs> in Marcy projects. Like when we talk about, you know, do you go back to the hood? Do you help your hood out? And he was just like, no. I don't want to, you know what I'm saying? Like, no, I'm not interested in that. And I almost kind of wondered just a little bit why. I mean, I kind of get it. Like, that's not who I am. I'm not there anymore. But at the same time, like, he really, he carried Marcy on his back only to drop it off. But I, I, I do think that, I don't want to get too far from the story, that people like Jay-Z and Kanye, they can help in other ways. Like, you don't have to be literal in your help. You don't have to go directly back to the corner that you used to hang out on. You can help there. I mean, in New York, there's a Marcy Projects every five blocks or, you know, definitely every five miles. Um, and you can help in different ways. So, like, I don't know what he's doing as far as, like, education resources. Yeah. I don't know if he has some kind of music training program. But in the end, that would also help people from Marcy Projects. You know, one thing with, uh, that Nazario had said in conjunction with working with Bodega, that they wanted to develop a certain educated group in um, East Harlem to stay there and to build mm -hmm. it up. And that, yeah. I really admired that because I think, I, I don't think you just, um, you know, get your education and just go to the suburbs or whatever. I mean, that's just my own personal thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think that, I think we need to um, do something with the communities that we grew up in, you know, and to help out the people who are there, to help out the children, etc. you know, um, not just to say, you know, we were there and goodbye so long. I'm not going to you know, even, you know, speak of you, you know, uh, because those communities developed us. Yep. You know, and we were, and we have to stand on the shoulders of, of, of the mama who said, are you going to school today? Or the auntie who said, um, I saw you throw away your homework or, or something like that, you know. So we, we really need to think about that, I think. But that's not absolute. I'm pretty sure that the people you and uh, Ron was mentioning before uh, feel they're doing the community by them continuing to go forward. I think I think um, that's part of what the what the the story is trying to tell us. Again, the romanticism life you have to be careful with with how you romanticize life because it's not always going to be that way, and it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the good way to go. I think the most important thing is that you live your life. Like, if you become a successful person, one, you live your life without guilt, uh, without this feeling like you must go back to the neighborhood. Um, and your success will kind of manifest in different ways. But, you know, if that's what you choose, I mean, the reason why I program in the South Bronx is because I'm from the South Bronx. Uh, but... If I was in Harlem, I'd be, you know, programming in Harlem right now. So people do go back all the time and people stay. Uh, but, you know, everyone is not going to stay. So, Well, like you said, there are different ways to give back to your community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and I think, I think we really need to think about that and consider it. Like you said, everybody's not going to stay in the same place that they grew up in, but maybe they're going to give to a school or maybe they're going to have a program or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. but we, 
And I think we really need to do that. That's the only way that we as people can grow. That's, that's my opinion. I don't know. That's good. It kind of feels like that. Uh, um, uh, uh, that uh, you mentioned when they started the old record company that's kind of picking that, but they're picking that from the context that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not produce the music that I think should be happening. So that's giving back to the community too, although you're not physically going back. You have to, uh, uh, and I think, Ern, Ern, that's the same, be careful that you don't uh, box yourself in to certain things, from thinking to living. Those were some great, very generous answers and insight. And I wonder if Chino is kind of like a Ron Kavanaugh in that sense. That. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I think I think Ron is above him. <laughs> don't know me, girl. Think about yeah. it. <laughs> you don't know Ron. <laughs> I think Chino. I think Ron Kavanaugh and Chino have a lot in common. Think about it. Like Chino is a is a college educated man who. I'm not, I'm not college educated. Oh, we are stripping him now. <laughs> I didn't mean to put you on blast, Ron, but you didn't. I, I <laughs> Not even one year. <laughs> she didn't go to Lehman. You didn't go to Lehman. I went to Lehman for half a year. There you go. Um, you college educated. <laughs> That's my alma mater. Yes, you are. <laughs> but we'll get to Ron. See, Brandon. <laughs> See, Brandon, you judge the book by its cover. Literally, like, literally, I judge Ron by his cover. I guess what I mean by that is somebody who is extraordinarily intellectual. Oh. However, it's slinging books in the front. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think she knows that guy as well. He is obviously very well, um, he's like a master of his craft in a sense. He got to go to, um, for his murals, he got to go to a, an arts high school. Now he's like at Hunter. And I think that in that sense, like he knows, like he knows he has a craft, right? I think we talked about that a lot a few, couple weeks ago. However, um, he doesn't, he doesn't feel like he is, he, he wants to be like in that Hunter world, in that world of like suit and tie and and that kind of like maybe more scholarly gallery success like it, it seems like it feels like to him success is a little different than that using his craft but staying in his community i think there's a big thing there for me in this book so far um the big theme is is using your craft using what the streets gave you right molded you into um to to kind of really stay there and survive and 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 have that success where you were born, have that success where you were raised, no matter where it is. Like that's kind of the theme, one of the themes for me in Bodega Dream. I often, um, I don't know if this is just me, but I haven't gotten the sense of who Chino really is, like his identity. Um, like I feel like he split in between like, you know, we clearly know what Blanca wants. And I feel like he wants, at some points, I feel like he wants what Blanca wants because they've been a high school sweetheart. Um, he's not fully dedicated to school. Um, he has, I think it's a part-time job at the supermarket. Uh, so when he speaks to either Nazario or um, Bodega, he talks about them like, oh, they living in this, very elusive kind of world that they want to accomplish all of this and you know he definitely doesn't agree of you know of the drug movement and you know putting drugs in your own community like that's something that he has said to Sapo but I don't know like I just I haven't gotten what um what uh, Chino is truly he believes of what he's passionate about like I just haven't gotten that sense yet of him you know what I'm really glad you said that. We got three minutes left, and I want to pick this back up next week. Perhaps Ernesto can kind of give us a little more insight, but I was thinking about this a lot. It's like the exact what, what you said, Liana, I was thinking about a lot. And you know what my conclusion was? And I would love for someone else to chime in in these last couple minutes. My conclusion was like, 
you have to know Chino. When I say no Chino, I mean lived in the building with him, knew him from the block, like knew him when he had, you know, snot running down his nose all the way to height. You have to know Chino already in your life to know Chino in the book. Does that make sense? It does. It will help a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You have to know Chino to actually know him. I don't think he can be put on the page in the way that me or Liana would would be able to maybe truly understand him. I think you have to already know him. You mean there's only one Chino? I mean, there's several Chinos. No, I mean, yeah. I saw Chino in the, when he was, when he was sitting in the classroom with Blanca and he was like, he would purposely leave his book. I was like, oh, you that guy. You that dude that's been like, just, um, 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 my mouth. You know, like, I don't know how to say that in English, but it's just Sucker. like a, a suck, right? A like, yes, he's a sucker for Blanca. And I've seen that kid mm -hmm. in school. You know what I mean? Like, I've seen that, that, that's just like, again, manipulative with his, oh, I'm going to leave my book just so I can sit next to her. Or maybe just incredibly, like, in love as a teenager but I've seen this kid and so it reminds me of what you're saying that oh you have to have known that person <clears throat> to see Chino in the book yes precisely does anyone have any closing thoughts we got two minutes left maybe someone who hasn't said anything yet Jasmine I know you have a lot of kind of things that you put in the chat that I thought were really great yeah I mean I just think this is like a story that I know guys that are like this and I think it's just an insight into what guys got to go through in their head trying to stay one foot in the hood and one foot going to college but also you know <laughs> you always go you get you you get married you go to college yeah and a lot of people didn't especially back in those days is that that's what you did you if you thought if you came from a family like Vera who wanted to get money and that's what you did and then there was you go to college that's what you do and you stay in the neighborhood you're in. You didn't think too far ahead sometimes, depending on how you were brought up. So I think it's a great uh, uh, insight mm -hmm. into one person's story of the hood and trying to figure out what direction and where to go and who to be when you're in this, uh, in El Barrio. So. Mm -hmm. Those were perfect. That was a perfect like little, that was like a massage. That just like wrapped <laughs> everything. <laughs> that just wrapped it up perfectly. Um, Eight thirty. <laughs> so we're going to end now. Next week, Ron Ernesto will be with us. Uh, Ernesto Quinones will be here um, in the chat. And usually, what happens is, even though we have pages assigned um, that we're going to discuss, we usually just ask a lot of questions of the author. Um, you know, he seems, I've, I've met him before a few times. He's a great person. So definitely, you know, come through if you can. Uh, you know, like how we do hang out if you want to, be fully engaged if you want to. Uh, it's totally up to you. But all those questions that you've been having, uh, he's the person to ask. You know, we've been asking each other now for three, four weeks. So now he's, he's the person to ask. Um, and he'll be able to really explain everything to you. So, uh, yeah, that's it from me. Thank you so much. Thank I'll you, probably Thank you.